Uh, so first, how many people have used Raven before? At all? Okay. Anybody downloaded it or tried it? Checked it out? Okay, well. Um, who heard of it before they saw it in the conference program? Yeah. Yeah. Alright, cool. Um, so, because of that, I'll go through some uh, sort of general description of what Raven is, how it works, why it's interesting, uh, and then uh, go into uh, some of the issues we found in implementing it at a larger scale and a high availability environment. And that's really one of the things we're going to focus on is uh, you know, how do you, and developers like NoSQL databases, they're great. Um, I was a developer. You can do a lot of things, you can change your mind, you can deploy really fast, but uh, the operations team is equally important. So everything that uh, we did and that I'm going to talk about here has a full focus both on developers and on operations. Um, and I think that's been a theme of, of some other things, uh, some other talks that we've heard here, um, that you know, developers may love it, but what happens once it gets into production? Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that as well. So, Raven is a document database. Uh, it's similar in that way to uh, Couch or Mongo. Um, you know, not as similar to things like React or Cassandra. Um, the, it's schemaless. Um, it's accessed, the Raven server is accessed through an HTTP uh, API. Uh, one of the things that makes uh, Raven a little different, and it's also been a topic in a lot of the uh, discussions this week, it is, uh, it's fully acid. So when you're saving anything, it's always written to disk. Um, and that storage is actually desynced, uh, which has been around since Windows NT as part of Windows, but nobody really knows about it. Uh, it's actually the transactional disk storage that's used by uh, Active Directory and Exchange Server. So it's a very mature, very reliable disk storage. Uh, indexing. Uh, so you can sort of think of a Raven server as a package of services and tools and uh, a really great development environment around Descent, the storage, and Lucene, the search. Um, so you've got you're storing your documents on disk, then Lucene is doing a lot of interesting things. Uh, in uh, you can easily extend the server. Uh, you can extend the client as well, um, but you can basically just drop a DLL into the server uh, bin, and uh, it'll get loaded up using that. Uh, how, many, how many .NET folks in here? Got a couple. Um, so MEP is a way of sort of dynamically loading the DOLs um, based on interfaces uh, that you declare sort of contracts that automatically load them up. So you just drop a DLL in and it'll load up whatever new functionality you want to add to the server. I'll talk about some of that. Um, there's a management UI in Silverlight. It's okay. It's fine for sort of playing around. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things we did at NBC to make it really suitable for an operations team. Um, we actually built our own UI. Um, and you can host Raven as a Windows service in IS or you can embed it. So if you want a desktop app that you use Raven, you can do that. And there's a license for that as well. Um, the, uh, the team is actually working on changing or adding a new storage engine in addition to ESET so that it can run on uh, Linux boxes since ESET is a Windows thing. Um, so they're very actively working on a new storage uh, engine that will allow them to run on multi platform. So the client side of Raven, it ships with the .NET client. Uh, Raven's written in .NET, the server as well. Um, but there are clients for JavaScript, PHP, and Ruby out there, although they're not official from Hibernate Linux, but uh, it's pretty well supported by the community. And I think there are others underway, or at least being requested uh, by a lot of folks for Java um, uh, as one example. It's really just a wrapper around the HTTP API. Um, it provides a lot of additional features, caching, uh, change notifications. So as a client, you can say, I want to know anytime this document changes, or I want to know anytime this set of document changes, or I want to know anytime a document that matches this query changes. Uh, you'll get a notification on the client side. Uh, and that's done through, um, there's a technology called SignalR, which is basically a web sockets kind of thing built in .NET uh, that works really well. Um, so it keeps the socket open, and then it does fall back to long polling and all that sort of thing. 
Um, the link querying is a big deal. Uh, so a lot of folks here are not .NET folks, so uh, we'll show a little bit of link and why it's interesting. Uh, another one of the themes at this conference has been uh, standard query languages. You know, will SQL evolve to where, or will these products evolve to where they can um, map SQL into queries in these NoSQL databases or some other language? Um, link is a really interesting thing that uh, addresses that issue. Uh, so licensing, um, it is open source. You can download it, you can play with it, you can contribute to it. Um, the license is uh, GPL, uh, so it's copyleft, and careful with that. Um, if you pay for it, you're off the hook for any of that, you can do whatever you want. Uh, there's also an exception for open source projects. Uh, you can get a free license um, if you have any project that uses an OSI license. Um, commercial licenses are based on scale. Uh, there's also some stuff like the clustering support and compression and encryption of the data on disk uh, that only comes with the higher end of the processes. So briefly, I just want to show the UI. Um, so this is the, the Silverlight UI that I mentioned. It's pretty simple. Um, you know, if you're spinning up a project, you're a developer, you get it going, this is great. Um, it's not great for an operations team. Um, but you can go in and, uh, you know, create new databases. Uh, I've created two here. Um, and when you go into one of them, you can look at documents, although there are no documents here. Uh, create a document. Save it. You can see it gave it a GUID as an ID when I saved it. Um, you don't have to do that. You can give a document any ID you want. <coughs> um, I've got a little issue with my uh, Silverlight here. It's one of the reasons I'm not a huge fan of the Silverlight UI. It won't let me type, but it'll let me paste it when I do. Um, so if you give it your own ID, uh, it will save. Um, there's another interesting thing where you, uh, well, we'll talk about ID generation and how clients can manage the ID generation later on. So there's a lot of, there, there are some interesting things, which is why I, I show that here. It's um, not just super trivial. Collections uh, are a way for Raven to group documents. Some people think of them as tables, but they're not tables. Everything in Raven is just a document, they're all the same. This is just a way of, if you have a .NET class, and you save it through the Raven API, um, it will be tagged with the metadata. So we go back to a couple of these documents and open one up. You can see there's metadata here, which in this case only has stuff about replication, tracking this document in case it gets replicated. But if you save through a, the .NET client, it'll actually save additional information here about the .NET CLR type so that it can be deserialized back into the right type of object. Uh, indexing is uh, one of the really interesting features. We'll talk about that in some detail. Um, and you can start to see a little bit of link here, although um, this actually is more JavaScript than it is link. But you define an index. Um, you can also define uh, MapReduce indexes. Um, so you can do a lot of calculation, a lot of uh, Statistics reporting. I mean, Raven is not great for sort of star schema style EI reporting. I uh, probably would not want to do that with Raven, but for things like, you know, I wonder how many comments are on a blog post about going and doing a count on them over time. Um, you can create a map reduce that will do that sort of thing, store it in the index, and then you can just load up the index uh, as a trivial example. You can also do transforms, uh, which are server side projections. So, you know, typically a SQL query, you'd say, you know, select star from X, join Y, and then you start to, you know, pick out the fields you want from the different tables. So you can do that sort of thing in Raven um, across documents. So you don't want to think relationally about <coughs> creating a document model. I'll talk a little bit about that. But you can, if you're loading up a document, um, go grab some information from other documents and do 
reduce the number of uh, properties that you're bringing back across the wire. Uh, patching is great. Um, you can do a query or specify a single document um, and essentially perform operations on every document that matched the query. So this is one of those developer-friendly things where I want to keep evolving my schema. I don't want to get I don't want to start working around the schema I created before I knew everything I needed to know. Um, so you can say, uh, and you can do everything I'm showing here, you can do in code as well, rather than through the UI. Um, so everything is automatable or can be done as part of the deployment. Um, so if you want to update your object model, you can go ahead and update the data as well during that deployment. Uh, some operations friendly tasks here for importing, exporting, backups, uh, turning indexing off. Um, there are some scenarios where you might want to do that. And uh, the product is mature when it has Excel in direction. So. <laughs> um, you can also do the logs. So just a quick tour around the UI. We'll talk about some of these things in, in more detail. Um, Oh, um, let me show a little bit of code as well here. Um, can everybody see that? Yeah. Um, so when you, uh, and this is .NET using the .NET client. Um, and remember, underneath this, all it's doing is making HTTP calls to the server. Uh, in fact, I've got a couple of Raven server instances running here. Uh, and when you run it just as a standalone EXE, it brings up a console so you can see all the requests that are making. So you can see some of the things we were just doing in the UI for making requests here to the server. So how do you use it? When your app starts up, you create a single instance, a singleton of the document store, um, and that's sort of your unit of caching. Everything you do within the context of this store is cached on the client. We'll talk some about that. Uh, you initialize it. I'll come back to the conventions. Uh, if you wanted to uh, just create a new object, so I've created a speaker object. This is just a .NET type that I created here. A couple of types. So I create a speaker object, create a session object. One of the interesting things is that the speaker ID in the session object uh, it's just a string, so there's nothing special. I haven't done anything with my types here, but Raven will recognize this as an ID of something else, uh, and it'll do some interesting things with it. Um, if I go ahead and save up to set, you can, by default, you probably want to be using optimistic concurrency. Um, it's not on by default, um, and typically I'll do this in the infrastructure code at startup so that every session automatically gets it without anyone doing anything. Um, then you store them, call save changes, and stuff. And this is a unit of work. So anything you do inside the session before you call save changes, when you call save changes, it'll happen with a transaction. That's a single unit of work. Uh, loading is similar. It's called load, tell it what type that, that you're going to want to serialize into, give it the ID. Um, loading with include, so this is to prevent the n plus one problem. You know, I go back, I go to my, I get a list of documents and then each of them has a property. I want to go get the other document that it points to. Um, you can do that here. So I load up the session and I'm saying, hey, when you load up the session, also load the, the thing that has this ID in speaker ID, whatever it is. Um, so that way, on this second call, it looks like I'm going to make a second round trip to the server, but it doesn't. It's already locally in this session and in the client. Query um, And this is an example of link. Um, so you can do all of your querying through Lucene syntax if you want. Um, if, you're, if you know Lucene and that's what you like, you can do that. In fact, if you're using the HTTP API, um, that is what you're going to pass in your query string for a query. Um, it's a Lucene syntax. But in the uh, there's a much simpler way, uh, using link. So if you aren't familiar with, with link at all in .NET, um, it's language integrated query. It's a SQL-ish language. Um, it's built into C Sharp uh, and the other .NET languages that uh, basically is translated into something else before it's executed. So 
these things, these two chunks of code do exactly the same thing. It's just two different C-sharp syntaxes for doing it. Uh, one is uh, method-based, uh, and one is intended to look pretty similar to SQL. Um, but again, it's not being translated into SQL like an LRM would. It's being translated into um, a URL that's being sent to the server with the Lucene syntax. All right. So, why uh, Raven? Why did we choose it for NBC and RD? Um, so, just to give a little context for the, the problem we're trying to solve, um, this is what we call NBC News Digital Network. Um, it includes a whole bunch of websites. Um, you know, in addition to NBC News and Today, it's um, CNBC, MSNBC, um, all of the individual television shows like Dateline and um, Rachel Maddow and all that stuff. Um, typically, and these numbers are as of a year ago, um, I don't have access to the numbers anymore. So. Um, you know, about a little over a billion page views a month, a lot of video streaming. Um, a lot of unique users, about 60 million a month. And the traffic spikes are pretty big in the news business. So, um, you know, on average here, we're looking during a US workday, almost all of our audience was US, because people around the world don't really know and we see um, very well. But, uh, you know, on a typical workday, we're getting like 1,000 page views a second, uh, which translates into some number more of requests per second. Um, and that's on the web server, it's not on the radio. But we've, you know, there are days, whether it's a natural disaster, you know, typically bad news. Um, it could be something you know about ahead of time, like election night, or it could be something like a, you know, tsunami slash nuclear disaster, uh, or the biggest uh, traffic day of all time. And in talking with other people in the news business, they found the same thing was uh, the day that Michael Jackson. So we got a um, 100x spike in traffic. Uh, you know, he, the news broke late in the day. We got a huge spike in the evening. And the following morning, about 8 or 9 a.m., the East Coast woke up, uh, another massive spike. Um, so we had on the order of you know, a billion plus page views within 24 hours. So that's the kind of spike in this that we have. Um, and we install that very fast page load, instant publish time. So one of the measures that our editors and publishers use is you know, from when they hit the button, then you'd be able to flip to the browser and see their update. Um, you know, if you cache too much, it's just the, the usual tension between data freshness and caching to achieve scalability. Um, so that was a big concern. We're also deploying six or eight times a day. Um, you know, things happen fast, whether it's new advertising or new news events or new types of features. So the ability to deploy continuously without any downtime is very, very important. Um, and zero downtime, you know, for little asterisks, because you can't have zero. Um, you know, last week Outlook.com was down for a little bit, Amazon was down for a little bit, Google has gone down, Gmail anyway, Google Apps occasionally. So, um, but I like to define high availability as What's the amount of time that's down before you have to have an uncomfortable conversation with the boss? Uh, in our case, it was about five seconds. Uh, another way to put it is you can't have this. <laughs> um, the fail to be um, So in order to do that, you need to support rolling deployments and uh, rollbacks without any downtime. Um, and what that means is you're gonna have multiple versions of your code and multiple versions of your data structures that are saved. Um, you know, if you're, if you're changing, this, uh, adding a property, removing a property, changing the, the shape of your objects, multiple versions are going to be live at the same time. Uh, and in our case, we had a lot of messaging, so different message structures being passed around between applications. Um, and all of those things have to be forward and backward compatible, so that you can start rolling out, have everything work, and roll back if need be. So the old data, the old code, can deal with any new data that got created during your 
Um, so on failover, there's really two types. You know, you want to be able to, uh, you want the system to do the right thing. You want it to fail over on its own, but you also want to give the operations team the control to say, look, I need, you know, this data center is having a problem that the system can't detect. I need to send the traffic here, or this server, or this uh, particular application. Um, well, I skipped one about decoupling. You know, decoupling is always great, um, but it's not just physically um, having different servers doing different things. It's also the temporal decoupling. So if one part of the system is completely down, uh, you want the other pieces to continue to function uh, for some period of time. And depending on the application, it might vary between a few minutes or a few days. But you want things to not break everywhere just because one thing broke. Um, that's the, the temporal decoupling. You're not you don't require everything to be up at the same time. Some things can be down and everything else can function. Uh, and seamless scale out. Um, you know, all the NoSQL products are big on this. You want to be able to continue to add servers as the scale out goes. So in, in essence, what we were looking for was a private data cloud um, where we can evolve the schema where the app code, the developers don't have to worry about calling different places to get the data. They just, you know, call the one connection, the one session, uh, and uh, it talks to the right thing. It fails over. It talks to the closest thing. So if you're in, if you've got um, Raven instances in multiple data centers, uh, you've got a whole bunch of your applications in multiple data centers. You don't want the applications to be going across the country with your 150 millisecond round trip uh, to get data. We want them to stay in the data center they're in, but if all the Raven instances in that data center go down, you want to give them the option to go across the country. Slow is better than nothing, usually. So, uh, for all of these reasons, um, we chose Raven to be. Um, it was a pretty risky thing, it was new. Um, version 1.0, um, now it's in version 2.5, it just came out a couple, about a month ago. And there's a lot more features, it's a lot more robust. You know, we did find a lot of bugs, we were an early adopter and pushing it beyond what most people were using it for. Um, and today, um, well, a year ago, uh, we're using Raven behind all of the apps um, across all devices and, and mobile OSs. Uh, and also a growing number of sections of the site, um, the web apps. Uh, the Raven stats here are from a year ago. Uh, it's continued to grow. So this is when we were only doing a couple of sections, uh, a couple of new sections, and that's the way we sort of rolled right now. I should say, um, you know, on the operations team's uh, concerns, it may sound weird, but the very first thing we did was deploy Raven production. I would highly recommend that for all of you when you're trying out a new technology. Um, we, we basically put a Raven server into our build and deployment process and just deployed it with everything else. It wasn't doing anything, nothing was talking to it, but we just integrated it right into the deployment process uh, from day one. Uh, and that allowed the operations team to really get comfortable where is it? How do I monitor it? What am I looking at? And they can start to build up their knowledge as we're developing systems on top of it for the first time. So it's a shared learning across development and operations. It's really important. Um, you don't want to have developers work on something for three months or six months or nine months and then have the operations team say, what is this thing? I don't know how to deal with that. So get it out there early. Um, we're a little, a little short on time. We got a whole bunch of uh, detail, a lot of things I've talked about. We want to stop them and ask if there's any questions. Yes. Uh, do you have the ability to integrate with content distribution networks? Yes. I mean, Raven doesn't do that um, it, on its own. Um, but um, you have the UUID associated with documents, so you should be able to do that. Right. Um, so one of the things that's, that's in this detailed section is how Raven uses e-tags. Um, so Raven, you know, it's an HTTP interface, and so it adopts a lot of the sort of native HTTP um, idioms. So um, e-tags in Raven are basically sequential GUIs. 
Um, so the, the GUID you saw there when I created the document was, a, was an actual GUID, it was a total random, uh, it was as close as it can be. Um, an e tag is generated for every single update of every single document or index inside of Raven, and it's sequential. So you, basically, you don't care what the number is, but you care if it's greater or lesser than the number. Um, and so when doing things like uh, version control, optimistic concurrency, you know, two clients save the same thing, um, by, by default, that will fail. One of the things we did, um, this actually gets more into the replication. So if two clients save a document with the same ID to two different servers at the same time before replication happens, you get a replication conflict. And the e-tag is saved in the metadata, and it's, that's what um, allows you to resolve the conflict. In our case, we said the last one in wins. We don't care. That worked for our data. It may not work for your data. If you've got financial data or something like that, you may have a different strategy. But you do have to have a strategy for resolving. Uh, yeah, actually, let's, I, I'll, I'll get into that. All right. Um, so why don't I skip some of this stuff on the client? Um, although it really is talking about how, um, you know, this is another place where the e tags get used. So as a client, uh, a Raven client inside my app, I'm keeping a cache of all of the requests I've made, and I'm using the e tag to invalidate them. So if I request document one, two, three, and then again, in a different session, I request document one, two, three, um, Raven will make a request to the server. The client will make a request to the server with the if modified since header containing the ETAG. Um, and if it's the same on the server, the response will be just the 304. It won't send the whole body of the document back. Um, you can also control that. You can avoid even that round trip just to find out that you already have the latest. Uh, by turning on what's called aggressive caching, and you can configure that, um, you know, on any given session, you can say how long you want the results to be cached for. Um, one of the things we did um, for our operations team was make that configurable at runtime through an admin interface. So, you know, in the case of, say, the Michael Jackson event, um, they could crank up the caching um, at runtime so that the Raven clients would be making fewer requests to the Raven server. So, uh, sharding is not something we used because we had a very read heavy scenario. Uh, sharding is great for write heavy scenarios. Um, if that's what you have, then you can mix um, sharding and replication. So each shard can be replicated uh, any number of times. Uh, there is no rebalancing. So this is something that's different than a lot of other solutions. Raven will not rebalance your shards if you add another shard. You're going to need to go in and figure out how to move your data around on your own. It's a pain. Um, Raven does a lot of things, but it doesn't do that. So there's no concept of doing a hash of the IDs and then using the uh, module of the hash to distribute those at all? There, there is sort of. Um, so you, you can choose. Um, what the, the sharding strategy is. So um, when a, a document, when an object gets saved in the Raven client, um, it gets passed to a method that you've created. Right? And you determine which shard you want to send it to based on your method. So, so you could use a hash of the ID, you could use whatever you want. However, if you add a new shard, your strategy, your uh, sharding method is going to have to account for the fact that none of the data already is ever going to exist on that shard, unless you move it over yourself. Um, so indexing and querying is a big deal. I mean, other than the sort of operational stuff and replication I'm going to talk about, indexing is the, the big thing. Um, every query is performed on an index. Um, and if you don't create an index yourself, you can, you can just like in a, you know, a relational database, you can go in and create whatever indexes you want. If you don't do that, uh, Raven doesn't have a concept of table scans. Um, it will auto-generate an index based on the query you're running. And then it'll, it'll, it'll kick off that index creation process and immediately return whatever results, which in that case will be none, no documents, because it hasn't indexed. Um, 
indexing and replication both happen in the background asynchronously. So if you um, have a new query that's never been done and doesn't match any existing indexes, chances are you're going to get no documents back when you do that query the first time. But you will then have kicked off an index building process. So as you continue to query, more and more of the data that matches will start coming back. Uh, and that impacts operation stuff as well. You need a new index, you've got to make sure that you've created a way to uh, build that index across all of your Raven instances before real clients start making requests for that data. That's a pain. Um, <laughs> but there are some tools, um, because it's such a pain, there are some tools in the next version of 3.0 um, that will enable that creation. We actually created some of our own um, so that we could go and generate the indexes before we did the deployment of our code. Um, give them a couple hours to build with uh, you know, 40 or 50 gigs of data we have. It take an hour maybe to build an index. Uh, depending on the complexity. Is it, you know, it scans through every single document in the entire store, um, deciding whether or not it's in the index and then doing the revenue index. So it's very fast, but it's not easy. Um, the types of indexes um, are pretty varied. So your basic fielded index, just like in a relational store, full text index, um, and it ships with the, the basic we've seen analyzers for full text indexing, but you can customize it. If you have you know, logic for entity extraction or other semantic uh, extraction of your data, you can plug that into the routine analyzer and it will do that for you and store that in the Raven index. Um, spatial indexing uh, for maps, um, map reduce, as I showed before, with the transforms that are possible, even after the reduce step. Um, querying with link, which we showed, or we've seen some index. Um, we talked a little bit about index as being stale. You can control it. You can say, make this query, but wait until the index is no longer stale. But you have to be really careful with that. Um, you either set a very small timeout, um, 100 milliseconds maybe, 50 milliseconds. Um, Otherwise, you could just be hanging out there you know, until the, the TCP connection fails and times out. That thread will just be sitting there waiting for results. We talked about patching. Index scripts we didn't talk about, which is very interesting. You can actually create data in your documents uh, or create new documents based on indexes. So, and I gave the example before of using MapReduce to uh, you know, count comments on blog posts. Um, another way of doing that, you could actually write an index script on that index that at the end of the indexing process, it would take the, that value and actually insert it back into the blog post document. Uh, all happening on the server during the indexing process. So that way you you don't even have to make a query on the index to find out the result. You know, you're just loading your blog post document and it's got the count right in it. That's as up to date as the index, which is probably you know, 100 milliseconds or so from the last update. There's obviously a lot more interesting things than you know, writing a blog out, but the idea is very cool. Um, we talked a little bit about this, um, creating indexes before you deploy. Um, again, queries are done against indexes that can be stale. Um, so you need to make sure your application is dealing with that. Um, we had one case where um, too complicated to get into details, but basically we needed consistency, uh, but it needed to be on a property that was not the ID. Um, and since you can't guarantee that in Raven, uh, what we did was actually generate a new document that was based on a, a deterministic value so that we didn't have to count on the property. Um, so the ID was based on, it was basically the same value as the property. Uh, and then we could have competing uh, client instances looking at that document to determine who would do the processing. So replication, um, again, it's done in the background. Uh, it'll be up to date within, depending on your network speed and, and how much data is being written, you know, within tens or maybe hundreds of milliseconds. 
Um, all the replication is one way. So there's no concept of two-way replication, but it's easy to do that. You just set up two one-ways uh, in opposite directions. So if you want a master-master, kind of everybody can be written to uh, set up, then you just have everybody replicating to everybody else. Uh, we actually created the, the Silverlight UI is really focused on a single Raven instance. Um, so it, you'd have to go to that instance, set up the replication, open up another Silverlight UI, set up the replication on that instance, etc. So we wrote a UI that allowed us to uh, basically just with a bunch of drop downs say, I want this thing to be replicated across all of these ways. And I'm, I'm hoping that something similar gets into the, the actual Raven distribution or else. Um, uh, working with them to, to get what we need. Because that's that's an operations task that you know, they're not going to want to use that solar light uh, to do this. Thing. It's great for developers, but not for us. Um, so one thing that's new in 2.5 that just came out a month ago is setting a, a write value, a W value. So if you really need to make sure that you've got that data in multiple places, um, you can say, make sure it's in three Raven servers you know, has replicated to three other instances before I return to the client and tell them it's okay in that um, You know, and you can set a final value on that so that you're not hanging out for a bit and say, look, give it 100 milliseconds, make sure it's written to three places, and then it's Right, so um, you know, typically a write is going to come into a single Raven instance. It's going to get written to disk, and that's going to return. So that'll be very fast, as fast as the distance. Um, if, however, you need to make sure that data, you know, if that server blows up before it replicates out, you've lost that data. So the W value is a way to say, um, okay, when a write comes into me, no day, um, wait until it has successfully replicated to B and C before I tell the client, before I give a response that says, yes, that was saved successfully. And so um, the 100 milliseconds is just an example of a timeout. So, you know, if, if the connection between A and B is slow, or between A and C is slow, um, you want to send the, the client a timeout rather than tell them, well, I sort of have the data. So it's just like, that failed, you need to try it again. Um, so there's a document, just like in most databases, it uses doc, you know, documents or tables in the database to manage the database. So all of your configuration of Raven is done inside Raven documents. Um, the client will use the same replication document that the servers use to figure out their topology in order to do failover. And you can um, set in that whether you allow reads to failover or reads and writes to failover or whether you don't allow anything. Talk about new tags. Um, this is just some detail on how the replication happens, just to make the point that it's always from the source to the destination. So, what do you have? I have number 42. Oh, I have up to 49, so here you go. Here's the rest. Uh, and then the next time I ask, if the answer you give me is the latest document I have, I'm not going to do it. Um, so, we did set up this multi-master replication across all of the Raven instances, but in order to reduce the number of replication conflicts that happen, you know, where the same document gets written two places, and then there's a conflict when they try to replicate to each other, um, we, through our own code, sent all the writes to a single place, to a single one of the instances. Um, now, that could fail over. But at any given moment, all of the clients were only writing to a single instance. Anybody could be written to, but our code sent everything in one place just to avoid those conflicts. We still got them sometimes um, because of other you know, things happening in production. Um, and we wrote a, uh, a conflict resolver. This is one of the plug-in points in the Raven server. So if there's a conflict, you can hook into that event in the server during the replication process and decide what we want to do. Um, the default behavior is a little weird. It saves both versions and then creates a new document at the ID saying, hey, there was a conflict. 
and the client will read that and explode if it ever tries to read it. So our, our approach was uh, the last thing on the list. Whichever timestamp on the two different servers was later, that one was. Not ensuring that it was the same one that won on those servers. Uh, ID generation. Um, these is, uh, how many people are familiar with high level strategy for ID generation? It's, it's basically a way to let the client control the ID generation to give out IDs without having to go to the server, but guarantee that none of the clients are giving out the same ID uh, across them. So basically there's a high number, so everybody gets a high number, and then they get a range. The simplest way to explain it is, so here's 32 IDs you can give out. So every 32 IDs, there's a request to the server to get a new batch of IDs. Uh, and it's smart enough to um, auto, you know, basically do exponential um, expanding of that range. So if there's a ton of requests coming in for new IDs from a particular server, um, the range will expand so that it's not asking about it. Um, so just reviewing some of the operational stuff. Um, you know, in our case, we controlled where the writes went so that we can get replication conflicts. Uh, we allowed ops to control the aggressive caching time in case of high load. Um, deploying new instances was done with replication. So we'd spin up a new empty Raven instance, just set up replication to it, and a couple hours later, we have a new instance that we can have clients talking to. Uh, we did have scheduled backups. Um, and uh, you know, Raven supports all the typical backup utilities in Windows and all the uh, other vendors who do backups. Um, but we didn't ever need to restore because we already had all these multiple instances. In cases where the only case where you need a backup really is if you know you really corrupted your application wrote a bunch of bad data, uh, then you want to restore your backup and replicate that. Fortunately, that didn't happen to us. Um, you want to be able to copy indexes from one instance to another. The index definitions, so that each instance can rebuild those indexes, um, have them available before your code needs to make queries against those indexes. Uh, and there's a lot of stats endpoints um, inside the Raven server that you can use to, to see exactly what's going on. Things like, you know, how stale are the indexes? You know, each individual index you can see exactly how far behind it is, if it's behind. Um, you can see exactly what the replication status is, how far behind it is on different servers, uh, if it is behind. Um, so these are the things that I covered. Uh, just a lot of things to keep in mind. I love Raven, it's an awesome tool, but like any other tool, you gotta think about what you're doing. You can't just expect it to solve all your problems. Uh, for more information, and these slides will be posted, so uh, you don't have to copy this down. Um, I'll either tweet them out, my Twitter handle at the bottom of there, uh, but I think they'll be linked to from somewhere on the Dataversity site. So. Questions? Yeah, cool. Um, thank you. It's been great.